Haggai chapter 2. <clears throat> now, we're going to kind of jump to the other end of the book of Haggai this morning. And I don't know, I may go back tonight, but that won't confuse you guys any. So, uh, in chapter 2, earlier in chapter 2, we may, or chapter 1 rather, may go there tonight. But to, this morning, preaching uh, with mostly preachers in mind, though not solely preachers in mind, I want us to go to the end of Haggai 2 <clears throat> and the last word that came to the prophet. Haggai, who was appeared to be a prophet only for about, you know, as far as his ministry as we know, as revealed here by his prophecy, was a short one, but very, very effective. And we're going to look at verse 20 through 23. So if you don't mind standing for the reading of the word, we'll turn there together. <clears throat> I think that was a used glass. I meant to use this one over here. It wasn't? Oh, good. Whew. Scared me there for a minute. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Verse 20. And, the, and again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel. Now, you guys that are familiar with Haggai know that throughout the book, it is about <coughs> Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the remnant of the people that were there. And that's repeated, I should have counted perhaps, but that's repeated several times. Haggai, you say to Zerubbabel, the governor, you say to Joshua, the son of Josedek, and you say to the people. But here, the last words of Haggai are to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, of, uh, Judah, not to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and not to the remnant of the people. But God focuses upon Zerubbabel, the governor. So speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. And I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee a signet. For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I'd like to use this text and, of course, the account that leads up to it here. And I call this sermon, God puts his arm around the governor. God puts his arm around the governor. Father, I want to thank you for this time once again, and I know that it is common to say it's a privilege to be a part of the meeting like this last night, this morning, and, and indeed it is. You know if we are just uh, saying what we think is polite or proper or if, oh God, the heart is sincere, and I believe that Brother Beller, Brother Rogers, and myself, oh God, that and Brother Bishop, you couldn't but be sincere to be a part of the services that have gone on here without being thankful to you for the privilege of being a part of it. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that it is inspired, preserved. Thank you, O oh God, that we have the sure confidence that we are preaching your very word. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth. God, I pray for the help and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you'd give us ears to hear. I know the hour, I know that we've been here a spell and a, and a good meal is coming up and we look forward to the fellowship, but we don't want to waste this time either, dear God. I pray that it might be meaningful and helpful to some or all who are assembled here. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the former pastor. I in some ways feel sorry for Southwest Baptist Church. The pastor before me is there for 29 years. He was raised on a farm about 40 miles from uh, where our church is, and all of his illustrations through the years began like this. I was raised on a farm 
And after 29 years, he was still telling him, I was raised on a farm. Well, I didn't know that. I hardly knew the man. And I came in and started preaching, and I was preaching through the parables. And so a lot of the parables lend themselves to agricultural uh, implications, you know. So I got up and said, I was raised on a farm. And our poor congregation goes, oh, no, you know, like, here we go again. So I found all kinds of neat ways to say I was raised on a farm without saying I was raised on a farm. I grew up in an agrarian environment and things like that. You know, there's all kinds of ways to say it. But I'm thankful that I was, had the privilege of being a farm kid. My dad was a wheat farmer, and, and uh, we had cattle and such as that. And it was a great life. I'm so great, very grateful to God for it. When I was about uh, 11, maybe the summer I turned 12 years of age, my dad and I were plowing. And he had two tractors. The tractor that he drove was the best tractor, pulled a little bigger plow than the one that I uh, drove. His was a propane tractor. Mine was a gasoline tractor. And on the tractor and plow that I was using, there was a problem one day, and, and uh, my dad had to take a part of the plow, take it over to Enid, 40 miles away, and had to have a blacksmith do some work so I could continue plowing. So he said, uh, I'm going to go to Enid right after we have the chores done, and you go start plowing, you take my tractor and plow, and then as soon as I can get this done, I'll be back, and I should be back around noon. Now, he said, if I'm not back around noon, you remember how to gas up the tractor. Yes, I remember how to gas up the propane tractor. It's different than a gasoline tractor. And, you, you know, if you guys know anything about it, you've got to put the hose on it and connect it. You've got to turn on the valve that's the gauge, and then you turn on another valve that's larger, and it releases the air out of the tank. And when the gauge, uh, you set it about 90%, and when that starts coming out, you turn it off, and you turn your hose off, and you stop filling. And my dad said, now, don't forget, you just gas the tractor first, then grease the plow. Now, that sounds weird to people today. This is in the day before sealed bearings and all of that. You had to take a grease gun around, go around, grease the plow, and grease the tractor. So he said, gas the tractor first, and then grease the plow. Okay, I'll do that. And I knew that. I'd done it before. So my dad goes, and uh, I come in for lunch, and he's not back yet, and now it's time to go back to the field. So I go out to gas up the tractor. But I know what I'm doing. I'm 12 years old almost. And so I hook it up, and I get everything all set. And then I get the grease gun, and I start greasing the tractor, and then I grease the plow. And the next thing you know, it's gotten away from me, and I look up, and the whole tractor is in a shroud of this propane vapor, you know, the vapor that it is. And I mean, it's, it's everywhere and growing. Well, now, I'm 11, 12 years old. I look at that, and I completely panic. I mean, I'm just totally panicked. I think I, I got to get up there and turn that thing off at the tank. Oh, no, if I do, the propane will burn your skin. If I breathe it, I'm dead. Oh, no, what am I going to do? I start screaming and yelling. My mom comes out of the house, and my mom panics. She's generally a very calm person. She sees the big cloud of propane. She's all panicky and everything. And my sisters, I have a sister two years older and one two years younger. They encouraged me. They looked out the door and said, you dummy, what have you done? You know, like good sisters would do and that kind of thing. And so I'm thinking, oh, man, I can see the headlines in the paper tomorrow. A dumb farm kid blows up Noble County. You know, I just thought the whole thing's going to blow up. And it was just a terrible sight. And about that time, you know, it's like, a, like a, a, a story on TV or something. My dad comes driving in the driveway, pulls up in the pickup truck. I thought, now I'm go I am going to die. One way or another, I'm going to die. And my dad walks up. He gets out of the pickup, walks over to the tank where the main valve is where there's not even the cloud of gas, calmly turns it off and then unhooks the hose. And then he looks at me and said, Now, you were greasing the plow, weren't you? I said, Yes, sir. Next time, son, puts his arm around me. This is my dad. Put his arm around me and said, Next time, just gas the tractor like I said. And the next time you forget or it gets away from you, Turn the valve off on the tank like I've told you. And I lived through it. My dad didn't kill me. He didn't even yell at me. He just got in my face a little bit and said, like I said. And that's what made you feel so dumb. All I had to do is what he said. I'd have never had that panic. I'd have never had that issue. It never would have happened. Now, Zerubbabel is the governor. He's the man. Now, Josedek, uh, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, no doubt a significant, important man and responsible for the spiritual life 
of the people of Israel, but Zerubbabel was the governor, and he was the one responsible for leading the people of Israel back from Babylonian captivity. And we mentioned last night, and those of you that weren't here, you probably know the account pretty well anyway, know that when they came back from Babylonian captivity, uh, God told them that they were coming back for the purpose of rebuilding the house of God. Cyrus, the king of Persia, gave them the decree that they could go back for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. Didn't have anything to do with the walls, didn't have anything to do with the city, didn't have to do with anything else. Rebuild your temple. You may do that. And so they went back, they went to work, and in the first three or four months, they got the place cleared off enough where they could lay a new foundation. They put down the foundation, and as we mentioned last night, and that foundation, after they celebrated and rejoiced the building of the foundation, it sat there for 16 years. For 16 years. And sometimes we might look at the account and say, the people went off and they built their sealed houses and they got off on their own agenda and they forgot about God's agenda. Maybe sometimes we forget the responsibility that was to be borne by Zerubbabel, the high priest. Uh, Zerubbabel, the governor, rather. And Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Because if you study the account out, which I'm sure you've done, but if you study the account out, they bore responsibility too. And when Haggai came to confront them about their forsaking of God's agenda and their pursuit of their own agenda, listen up, please, don't forget, Haggai came to Zerubbabel, the governor, Joshua, the high priest, and to the people. So it wasn't like one party uh, bore responsibility and the other party did not. Zerubbabel was responsible for the neglect of God's agenda. Somebody say amen, so I know you're with me. And Joshua was responsible for the neglect of, jo uh, of God's agenda. And the people were responsible for the neglect of God's agenda. And so Zerubbabel now uh, has been confronted by Haggai, the prophet, to consider their ways. Now, the amazing thing is, we may or may not preach on this, and I'm just not settled yet on it, but the amazing thing was about Haggai the prophet, he had a unique response compared to most prophets. The people did what he said. They actually considered their ways. This is a unique response. That didn't happen to many of the prophets. Where they, In fact, God told some of the prophets when he called them, they're not going to listen to you, just go what I say what I say. And, they, and God said to Jeremiah one time, they like to come hear you, but they're just not going to do anything you say. And so Haggai had this unique experience that he said, thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. And that's in chapter 1. And he says the second time, thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. And I, it's shocking they did. And they began to do what God said. And they got back on God's agenda. Now, uh, here's the point I'm going to try to make. That just because they got back on God's agenda... It didn't mean that all the results of the forsaking of God's agenda for 16 years, it did not mean that all the results of that went away. They still had issues, and they still had things to deal with. And by the time we come down to the end of uh, the prophecy of Haggai, we understand that the work is going on on the temple. It's coming up out of the ground, and they are making progress, but there are serious issues. And there are serious issues that are directly related to the fact that for 16 years they were busy doing their own thing, having completely forgotten God's agenda. But according to the loving kindness and the patience of God Almighty, knowing the problem that Zerubbabel is having, God comes to him with words of encouragement. You guys know and you ladies and gentlemen know that all through the Old Testament it's not like many people think. Oh, the God in the Old Testament is a God of judgment, and He's mad all the time. That's the stupidest thing I've heard since they searched through heaven and found a Savior. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's just the most ridiculous thing. God is God in the Old Testament, and He's God in the New Testament, and He is patient, and He is kind, and He is loving, and He is reassuring. And here in this account, He comes up to the governor, and here's the way I like to put it. He did like my dad did when I was in this confused state, in this confused mess, when he could have been justified in giving me a whooping, you know? He could have been, but my dad comes up and said, Now, uh, let me tell you what to do. Do what I say. And let me give you some words of instruction and words of encouragement. I remember that scene in my mind when I thought my dad might whop me into the next county. He comes in, his arm is around my shoulder, and he is telling me. He and I talked about that years later. 
And he, you know what my dad said? I said, you know, Dad, I was amazed on that day that you didn't knock the fire out of me, you know. Not that he was abusive or anything. Well, they would call it abuse today, but I'm just saying. Not that he was abusive. But I was amazed at that. You know, my dad said, you know why I didn't? Because I was asking you to do more than an 11-year-old kid ought to be doing. And I felt guilty about it. And that's what it was. And so God comes along. I can just see him, can't you, beside Zerubbabel. And he said, now, son, you got a mess on your hand, but I'm right here. And I'm going to give you some instruction. That's why I call it God puts his arm around Zerubbabel. Now, what I'd like to do to begin with this morning is to understand why Zerubbabel and not the others. Why Zerubbabel? Why did God come and speak to Zerubbabel this time when always before, uh, thus saith the Lord uh, to Zerubbabel, thus saith the Lord to Zerubbabel and Joshua, thus saith the Lord to Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the people. Why this time God speaks just to Zerubbabel? So the thing that I conclude is this, that God encourages Zerubbabel because God is aware of the unique burden of leadership. He is aware of the unique burden of leadership. You know, there was, um, there was a burden that Zerubbabel carried that was no one else's responsibility to carry. He and Joshua, the son of Jozadak, did not carry the same burden. The chief people that returned from Babylon out of the 42,000 that came back, the chief people uh, that came back from Babylon did not carry the burden that Zerubbabel bore. He bore that burden uniquely upon his own shoulders. No one else could understand it. it, it there are pastors and preachers in here. Did you ever try to say to a church member, well, well let me tell you what it's like to be a pastor. And if you ever have, I guarantee you didn't get two sentences till you thought. There's no point in this. They're not going to understand. And that, that's not putting anybody down. That's just saying they're not going to understand. We have several firefighters in our church, and they've been in some very unique situations, including the bombing of 1995 when Timothy McVeigh blew up the federal building. And I've had some of those uh, policemen and firemen try to tell what it was like. And you know what? I appreciate them telling me, and I got some insight from it. But when the bottom line comes, they say, you would just have to have been there. You would just have to have been there. And you know they're exactly right? I don't know what it is to go into a burning building. I don't know where it is, what it is to go into a building that's been bombed, and there are bodies under here, and maybe people crying for help under here, but the rest of the building might collapse on you. I don't understand what that's like. I've never been in that situation. And it's the same way in any realm or any profession. You can have somebody sit down and tell you, here's, we got some accountants in our church. Here is the, here, here's what the tax season is like. Well, those don't need to try and tell me what the tax season is like. I hate math. I hate dealing with numbers. I don't even like it. I don't even care. You chose to be an accountant, live with it. That's my attitude about it, right? And so I'm not, I can understand what an accountant goes through. And, and here's the rebel. Who could understand what he was going through? I'll tell you who understood what he's going through. God understood what he was going through. Every once in a while when my wife or, and I are on vacation or we're traveling somewhere and if we have time, she likes to antique, going to antique stores. And I got to where I can kind of enjoy it. I go in and look for old tractors from my generation. And that's why I can live with going into these junk houses, you know, and so we go in there and once a while, and one time I was looking, um, my wife was over here looking at something, I was looking at these old life or look magazines from the past, and I found a couple of very interesting ones, they'd done a spatial, I can't remember which magazine it was, but they'd done a spatial on some of the critical times in the lives of our presidents uh, in the 20th century. And, of course, this was probably, this magazine's probably done in the 1960s, late 1960s, maybe as late as 70. And I looked through there, and they had pictures of, for example, they had pictures of FDR sitting at his desk in the Oval Office and getting ready to address the nation after Pearl Harbor. So help me, you could look at that picture, and you could see on him a weight that no one else knew about. Only the president, only the commander-in-chief could know it. Another picture, later on in World War II, when Truman was about to uh, order the dropping of the bombs on Japan. 
And here's Truman sitting there. And it's, it's as though you can see on his countenance and you can see on his face, this is the weighty decision. It's like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. And nobody could bear that but him. You know what I'm talking about. They had another picture of John F. Kennedy at the time of the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Chris, uh, uh, Missile Crisis. And they had a picture of him sitting there. And Bobby Kennedy was pacing back and forth in the office. They had a series of pictures there. And Bobby Kennedy had his arms behind his back, his Secretary of State, and he was uh, Walker Defense, and he was walking like this. And John F. Kennedy was sitting at his desk. And you could see by the countenance on their face, this is a weighty matter. This is something that only these two men could understand. I'm going to say that I know that right here, and God knows that right here, sitting in this room, there are some Zerubbabels. See, everybody is in this story. Everybody, everybody that's here is in this story somewhere. You're either part of the remnant of the people, or you're a spiritual leader, or you have some form of leadership like Zerubbabel. Nobody is exempt from the story. But I want to say that if you're in the place of leadership, I want you to know that God knows exactly where you sit. And somebody says, well, it's nothing compared to what Zerubbabel had to do. It's nothing compared to those presidents in the war. But I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter where you preach. It doesn't matter what size church you pastor. If you are over a flock, which is a flock of God, if you are called to be a pastor and a shepherd over that flock, then you sit in a place of great responsibility. And God is very mindful. And he is aware of the role of leadership that only you can know. Or someone who carries the same responsibility. Nobody else can know it. I have uh, the privilege of working with some really faithful and wonderful staff people. And uh, Brother Ted Inman has been our associate there for uh, 18 of the 19 years that I've been there. He and I are very close. And I'm very thankful for him. That there are times when I felt the need to bear my soul or bear my heart. Brother Hammett, I could only go so far because I knew Ted's not going to get it beyond this. Well, because he's not sitting in that chair. So I believe God comes to Zerubbabel knowing the unique position of his leadership. It might help us to understand, well, what was so, I mean, what was going on anyway? All right, now, if you get the picture in your mind, after they have considered their ways, after they've gotten right with God, they are building the temple. We might be inclined to say, great, this is what they're supposed to be doing. Surely God's going to make everything go fine now. But they still had issues to deal with. Listen to this. In their humanness, they were aware that they are still surrounded by enemies. Jerusalem wasn't in friendly territory then. No more than it's in friendly territory now. This is not a new crisis in our generation or in our lifetime or in our century that's going on in the Middle East. They were surrounded by enemies then. They were hated by everybody about them. Egypt wasn't for them. Assyria wasn't for them. Syria wasn't for them. The Ammonites weren't for them. They were surrounded by people that hated them and just as soon that Jerusalem lie in rubble as a testimony to the failure of their God. They would just as soon that happen. Now here they are trying to build this temple again and they are still surrounded by enemies. The second thing is, the city had no walls. They came back 42,000 people from Babylon. They didn't have an army. They weren't prepared for a war. There was no ability to engage in meaningful conflict there. If it was, it'd be a ruffian army like it was put together when we uh, fought the Revolutionary War here. Or many of the people that went to the Civil War. It's just some people that knew there was a cause. Let's go give them a good fight. That's all they would have had. They had no prepared military as opposed to the enemies about them having prepared military. Besides that, they still had other issues. They had food issues. Issues of necessity. Uh, if you were here last night or if you've read lately in the book of Haggai, listen to this carefully. They have just come out from under a time where God sent a blasting upon the land, where God sent drought upon the land, where God sent mildew upon the land. They had no stockpile of crops and food and all of that. By the time, look, they just got right with God. And God said, you so much, but it comes to little. I, you gather together and I blow up on it and it's not there anymore. You put your wages in bags of it. I've punched holes in your bags. And here they are in a fairly destitute situation, ladies and gentlemen. And there's no food supply. And the crops, it's going to take them a full year to start producing again. Is everybody with me here? And, and, and so they got to recover from this judgment of God that they've been under. And Zerubbabel is saying, yeah, everybody's excited now because we're building but what are we going to do when we run out of food? What are we going to do if some of our enemies attack? We don't have any walls to protect us. 
We don't have any army to fight. We're building today and people are rejoicing out there because this thing's rising up out of the ground and our future's looking good. But I know that we don't have enough food to take care of our people and finish this job. And I know our enemies hate us and they're all about us. And God looks at Zerubbabel and knows the unique burden that he's under. Here's the thing about a leader, and, and in this right about Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel is over here and he's overseeing perhaps uh, the uh, helping with the organization and the rebuilding of that temple, and here they are, we're building. So I picture uh, Zerubbabel with the people, and everything is about get up to the mountains and bring down the wood and build my house. So you got people that are bringing the wood out of the mountains. you got people that are cutting the wood right there. This isn't like the project when everything was done away from sight under Solomon. This isn't like that project. This is a different project. Let's get this house up. It's not going to have the same beauty and the same glory as that one where every stone was cut and fitted by the time it was brought there and then it was overlaid with gold. This, this isn't what it was uh, before, but this is what God wanted them to do. And here they are, and I can see Ozerable, and he's managing this and he's managing that. And all the people are working right here. If you can picture all this busy activity going on in the rebuilding of the temple. But the thing about the leader is he's not only got to have his hand here, he's got to be looking out there. Because we're going to run out of food one of these days. Because of the drought. Because of our disobedience. God didn't just all of a sudden fill their storage houses because they considered their ways. Come on, somebody help me, please. He's still got serious issues to deal with. And who's to say that some of the radical nuts around which they lived that despised Israel and prayed for their destruction even back then. Who's going to say some of them aren't going to get an army, an alliance of armies together and come against them and stop this work and kill their people and, and destroy any work that they've already done. So he's got to be busy with what's going on here. Plus he has to be looking out there in the future for any dangers that might be coming and the possibilities that you have to allow for and the preparation for the future. He can't give all of his attention right here. He's the leader. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. He's got to be looking out there. And God is mindful of his unique role of leadership. I just think it's a good thing to stop and remind. Let's say, let's start in the home. It's a good thing to remind parents. I, I hear all the time. We have some people in our church. They have uh, one family has uh, 12 kids. No, I'm sorry. They just had number 13. They just had number 13. We have another one that has 10, and they're about to have number 11. Or it's 11 and number 12. I mean, you get that many. What difference does it make? You know, we're right there in the ballpark. We got another one that has eight, and they truly believe God wants them to have 10 or a dozen kids. You know, you know the attitude of our society about that kind of thing, don't you? Our culture is not looking at that and saying, ain't this wonderful. And the attitude of the culture sometimes finds its way into church doors. huh? And sometimes the attitude of some of God's people isn't very understanding. And I tell people, if you don't like people that have big families, and if you don't like people that trust God for however many kids they're supposed to have, you may not like it, but don't let me hear you talking about it. I'm not interested in hearing you talk about it. If these people want to have a dozen kids, and they believe they're following God, then you watch God take care of their kids, and they may be a part of a great group that's going to raise up a godly seed to be serving the Lord. And I'm all for that. But I like to say to our parents, but anyway, what I was going to say is everyone say, right. why would people want to have more kids in this day and time? I mean, the economy is so bad and the moral climate is so bad. This world has never been favorable to raising godly children. We're not expecting the favor and the climate of our world to be right so we can raise godly children. And I would like to say to every dad, and I'd like to say to every mother who stands beside her husband, I would like to say, take heart. God is aware of the role that you have in leading your children. This is where it all begins, too, in leading your children to love God and to serve God and to be godly seed in this wicked world. God knows what you're going through. Oh, he's very mindful of it. Very mindful. I'd like to say to pastors where the, who are pastoring where the winds are, are blowing contrary. Strange winds are blowing out here regarding church life and regarding ministry. Oh, some of the weird, goofy stuff that's being said about 
church life and what it's going to take to reach our culture and to reach this generation and the adjustments that we're going to have to make and the old things that we can't do anymore. And sometimes you might look at it as a preacher and say, man, if I don't make this change and that change, if I don't adjust here and if I don't adjust there, and if I don't listen to the church gr gr gurus, all these other churches are going to grow past. I'm going to be eating their dust. I've actually heard preachers say, you may not like some of the changes, but you'll eat the dust of those that do if you're not willing to make them regarding music and a whole variety of things. And I'd like to say to encourage every pastor here, you just be the leader God wants you to be. He is very mindful of the role of leadership that is uniquely yours. He is mindful of all the strange winds that are blowing. He is, remind, he is mindful of the pressure that is on you to succumb and to conform and to go with those winds and to change all these directions. God is mindful of where you are, just like he was mindful of Zerubbabel and the pressures that were upon him. So God encouraged him. The next logical question would be, how did God encourage him? What did God do to encourage him? You say, God put his arm around Zerubbabel. Well, that's sweet. But what was that supposed to do? What did God say to him? Well, God encouraged him on two fronts in our account. Two fronts. I'm going to give these to you, and we'll just wrap her up. But I want you to look down in chapter 2. <laughs> look in verse 21 and 22. God assures his servant, on two fronts. Verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. More in a minute. Verse 22. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots, and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. Now, hold on just a second. Let me kind of put it in a phrase, in one sentence, what God is saying in verse 21 and 22 to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, can you see him putting his arm around him? You have no imagination, but I can see it, so I'm going to go right ahead. Uh, can you see him putting his arm around him and saying, Zerubbabel, let me encourage you this way. Your enemies are my enemies. So it's not all up to you to take care of the enemies. Because those very same enemies are my enemies. And Zerubbabel, I know what is in your heart. And I know what is in your mind. You look at the Assyrians and you look at this group of people in this nation over here and you look at the possibilities and you're afraid they're going to come and shake up what you're getting done. You're afraid that they're going to come and they're going to shake and, and shake the foundations and they're going to shake the confidence and the courage of the people that are building this temple. Well, let me just assure you, son, this is the second time he tells him in the prophecy. Let me just tell you this. I'm going to do the shaking. They won't be shaking up my plan. You just stay with my agenda. In as much as you are on my agenda, you need to understand that your enemies are my enemies and I'm going to shake it up and I'll take care of all the adversaries that are coming against you. That's what he's saying to him. Yep. I'm preaching through Zechariah right now. I just found in Zechariah that God said to Zechariah, you need to tell the people, no, I know the city doesn't have walls yet. But I will be a wall of fire around the city. <laughs> oh, we can't do this. Why can't we do this? Well, I mean, what if we're attacked? We don't even have walls around the city. You know, in our day and time, in this uh, time and uh, in, in, uh, in the whole scope of things, and in this time, cities have to have a wall. They have to have protection. We don't only have an army. We don't even have a decent wall. God said, I'm going to take care of your enemies because your enemies are my enemies. And as far as a wall for this city is concerned, I that's God. I, God, will be a wall of fire about this city. Sounds pretty good to me. Yep. Can't burn a wall that's fire. Like they burnt the other walls, can you? <laughs> yep. God said, I'll be doing that. Everything you need. Boy, I like this. Your enemy is my enemy. Now you just give this thing to me. I want to say that all the adversaries of raising godly children are adversaries of God too. Everything about this culture that is contrary to your family, your home, my family, my home, the family 
and the homes of my grandchildren, our three daughters, uh, two daughters and son, and their children. Their enemies are God's enemies too. That's why it's so important to teach leaders of homes and young families and so forth. you got to make sure your strength is in God. you got to make sure you're staying with God's agenda. Your purpose is not to go out here and read every book on the family and be concerned about, oh, I've got to watch for this, and oh, i got to watch for this, and oh, i got to watch for that. You know what you primarily got to do? Make sure you're on God's agenda. God says, when you're on my agenda, you understand this. Your enemy is my enemy, and I am right here, and I will take care of you, and I will destroy destroy your enemies and I will be your protection and I will, I will, I will, I will. He says it four times. Trust me, I will take care of you. I've had it said, Davidson's preaching is so simplistic. Yeah, it's really this simple. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. He makes me want to sing. Have faith in God. He watches us. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord. We've sung those songs for years. And when the, look, when the cloud is gathered, like the propane tank, or when the circumstances look adversarial, something happens to our feeble brain. We forget the clear message of even the great songs that we've sung about faith in God, trust in God, trust and obey. And inasmuch as His agenda is our agenda, He says, I'll do the shaking. I'll shake your enemies. You put your trust. You put your confidence in me. The second front by which or on which God encourages his prophet is found in verse 23. <laughs> Listen to the Lord who's always mad in the Old Testament. According to some. Listen to God. In that day. In what day? Well, in a day when you don't know what to do. In a day when you see uh, our storehouses are empty. In a day when you see, I hear there's a CIA report that there are three nations gathering together against us. God said, in that day, when you're at the end of yourself, when you're saying, great, now what am I going to do? I plugged into God's agenda, now what am I going to do? God says, let me tell you. Look in verse 23. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee. This is very personal. Can you hear God talking to, Haggai, uh, to uh, Zerubbabel here? It's very personal. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel. It's you I'm talking to, Zerubbabel. It's not another Zerubbabel somewhere. It's you. The son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what God said to Zerubbabel through Haggai? He said, you go tell him that I said that in the day when it looks like they're done, in a day when he doesn't know what to do, you just remind him how significant he is to me. Now this isn't self-help, Joel Osteen, find a champion in you kind of stuff. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking on the authority of the Word of God. And he says to Haggai, you go tell him just how significant he is to me. And you tell him that in that day, I'll take care of him. And I will take him and make him like a signet unto me. A signet. A signet. The signet would be the ring that a person of authority, primarily a king, would wear. And that king would wear the ring with his own seal or his own sign upon it. And whenever they would write up documents, they would often be on clay tablets. And they would bring the clay tablet to the king. And the king, is this what you mean? Is this what you wanted said? Is this, does this express your decree? Or does this express your command? Does this express your wish? Are these your words, O king? And he would say, yes, those are my words. Word for word, every letter is right. And then he would take the ring and he would put the seal upon it, saying to anybody that read it that this is by the authority of the king. Or if he didn't wear the ring on his hand, he wore the ring on a chain around his neck. The whole idea was that signet was so important. What if somebody got a hold of the signet that wasn't in agreement with the king? 
What if somebody said, the king said this, and here is his signet, but they had the king's signet stolen or taken from him so that that didn't happen. The king kept the signet right on his person, protected it with himself, either a chain around the neck or on his very hand. He protected the signet with his own person. And God says to Zerubbabel through Haggai, he says, look at this. You tell him that he is as close to me as a signet is to the king. He's mine. I will take him. I will protect him with my person. He will act with my authority. And God said, that's how close he is to me. Whew. That ought to make a man feel better. Hey, guy, you sure you got that right? Thus saith the Lord. I will make you like a signet. You don't have to think to worry about enemies. You don't have to think to worry about threats and dangers that are out here. You don't have to worry about a falling economy. You don't have to worry about this. And I'm not trying to downplay the significant mess that our country is in. Like the other preachers, I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm just going to say that the problems this country has are not really God's problems. God's above. Come on, somebody help me here. God's above these problems. This isn't hindering God. This isn't surprising God. God's not in heaven wringing his hands saying, oh no, what do we do now? Obama got elected. What do we do now? We're turning into a socialist society. God is not surprised by any of these elements. And the people of God don't need to be trembling and shaking. God says, hey, you plug into my agenda. You do what I have you to do. You care about the souls of men. You get new churches started. You send the gospel around the world. You live a holy life. You make it your business to know my will. And God said, I'm going to protect you from all the evils that are there. And I will hold you to my own person. Close to me like the signet is to the king. Wow. Again, this isn't the feel-good, positive thinking stuff that's out here. You, you know, you know, do you know what God did for Zerubbabel? In the lineage that is given in Matthew chapter 1 of the birth of our Savior, Josiah's son Jehoiakim was such a loser that he got excluded from the lineage. Do you know who is in the lineage? Zerubbabel. Right there in the lineage. Matthew 1.13. Right there. I wonder if God kept his word that he gave to Haggai to give to Zerubbabel. Here's how significant you are to me. I'm taking out this loser here and I'm putting in you, Zerubbabel, in the place of Jehoiakim. The son of Joseph. <laughs> and he's listed in that lineage of the son of God. Uh, you know, with, uh, at the risk of sounding Osteenish, there's nothing wrong with on the authority of God remembering how significant we are to God. No, this isn't about self-help, feel good about yourself. No, this isn't being all about us. But there's nothing wrong. Paul's in a significant time. I said the Apostle Paul spent a significant amount of time trying to get believers to understand who we are in Christ. You want some self-esteem? You just read Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 6, 7, and 8. You'll see. You, you want some self-esteem? Feel good about yourself. As a Christian in this wicked world, you just go read the book of Ephesians. And it begins to tell us who we are in Jesus Christ. And, and I just jotted down a couple of verses here that probably you'll recognize. Where Peter the apostle said, but you're a chosen generation. But you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. God says, hey, did, did you know that you're one of my jewels like Brother Bishop was talking about last night? Did you know that you're special to me? Did you know that God said you are chosen, you are royalty, you have an individual priesthood, you could together make up a holy nation, you are a peculiar people. Did you know that the book of the Revelation says that Jesus loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father? That's what he says about us. Yep. Something else ought to make a preacher feel secure. Is when the glorified Jesus in John 1 is walking among the candlesticks. And as he walks among the candlesticks, which are the churches, in his right hand are seven stars. And those stars are the overseers 
of that church, of each particular church. Hold it. In his right hand. You're worried about the elements out here? Now, if you're dependent on yourself and you're on your own agenda, you ought to be shaken. But if you're plugged into his agenda and you are in his right hand, he'll do the shaking. Oh, it's not any of that. It's some trouble in heaven within the church. Right. I think probably most preachers' stress comes from what's within more than what's without. But the same thing is true. I said the same principle is true. The enemy of what's right. No, preacher, if you're plugged into God's agenda and his agenda has become your agenda and your, your heartbeat and your desire is faithfulness to the word of God and to lead the flock to be what a New Testament church is supposed to be, I'm talking about if that is what you are about and your life is right with God and you're walking with God, look at me, ladies and gentlemen. He has you right there in his right hand. There's not enough deacons in this world to be afraid of. Amen. Oh, there's a certain element. There's a millionaire here. And a millionaire there. And they, they've got power and they've got influence. This is an old family in this church. And they got power. Yes, I've pastored a couple of churches and I know a little bit of something of what that's about. But I'm here to tell you right now that God didn't put you there to be the pastor to walk on eggshells about people that think they have authority. God says, you're my Zerubbabel. You need to know. You follow me. You do my agenda. Do what I say. Handle the word of God. Feed the flock. Do the work of the gospel. And let me be your strength. And I'll do the shaking because every enemy you have, every enemy you have right with me, God says, is my enemy too. I'll take care of it. And he will. And he will. Let me show you something here and I'm done. It's, it, it's not more preaching. I just have four verses to look at. Look in verse 13 of chapter 1. The end of the verse. If you already closed your Bible, that's fine. Just listen to this. Chapter 1, verse 13. At the end, I am with you, saith the Lord. <laughs> 2 4, chapter 2, verse 4. Be now strong, for I am, at the end of verse 4, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. 2 19. From this day, end of verse 19, from this day will I bless you. That's what the Lord said. And 2.23, I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, uh, hold on. These are people that were disobedient to God in spite of all the elements. I understand those. But according to his word, disobedient to God. 16 years. And his readiness to restore, to forgive and bless was and continues to be utterly amazing. And to reassure his people four times in this book. I am with thee. I am with thee. And I will bless thee. And you are mine. I don't know what more we could ask for. I don't know what more. Kind of makes me want to check. Make sure that my agenda is really God's agenda. Thanks, Lord, for these moments. Encourage the hearts of your servants.